Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizen Bank Studio. I hope you're having a great day as we uh, continue to keep the people who are in the in the uh, line of uh, destruction of Hurricane Helene in our thoughts and prayers as it works its way up through Georgia and South Carolina. It's amazing uh, what a what a storm like that can do, and we'll hope that there. The, uh, the, it's not catastrophic, but we know it's going to be in some cases. Uh, we'll watch and pray and do what we can to help them. Uh, it's Friday, so we're going to be spending time with my friend Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. We're going to talk about a tough loss last weekend, some key injuries, and a really upco- uh, significant upcoming rivalry game with the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Jeff, how you doing, my friend? Doing good, Ricky. Good to hear from you. And uh, yeah, you're right, man. Atlanta week is always special. So I'm excited about uh, seeing this game this weekend. The Saints are kind of the walking wounded right now. We've we've had at least one player placed on injured reserve. One of our most important. You actually rated him number one in your uh, players that you wouldn't want to lose on the offense. And then we've got some other key injuries. Why don't you kind of run down what you know about well, obviously, Eric McCoy had to have groin surgery this week. Uh, he went down on the third snap of the game against the Eagles, and that's a big loss, Ricky. He's, he's been playing at a very high level. Uh, he's kind of the captain of the front line, uh, the most experienced guy up there, uh, sets all the protections, You know, really gets them in, in and out of the right plays. They put a lot on his plate. So, uh, you know, they're going to really struggle to replace him, not only, uh, you know, the intangibles of his knowledge and know-how, but also just his sheer athleticism uh, at center. I mean, they, that, that he fit really well into the Clint Kubiak offensive scheme, was a big factor in their first two wins. Uh, he's definitely out. He's out for probably six to eight weeks. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. And then they had some other new names on the list that we weren't expecting. You know, Alvin Kamara didn't practice Wednesday. Uh, let's see, Demario Davis didn't practice Wednesday. Uh, Cesar Ruiz, the starting right guard, didn't practice. We'll see how they progress during the week. I'm, I'm really concerned about Demario Davis just because that's the second hamstring injury he's had. He didn't finish the game. He came back in for one play uh, against the Eagles, but he would be a, almost as big a loss as, as Eric McCoy because he's the defensive captain. Uh, on that side of the ball, really the heart and soul of the defensive unit. And in a game like this against Atlanta, has a terrific running game with B. John Robinson and, and uh, Tyler Algier, uh, they need DeMario Davis. So a lot of guys down. But, you know, this is the case around the league. You know, the Saints were one of the healthiest teams in the league the first two weeks. And it kind of caught up to them this week. And it's just part of the NFL managing injuries. Atlanta's dealing with missing two offensive line stars themselves. It's kind of how the league's built, and you have to have good quality depth. And uh, we're going to see how how good and how quality the Saints' depth is this week. Hey, just so uh, you don't think I'm confused, um, I want to make sure I'm quoting you properly from the story you wrote. Uh, Eric McCoy would have been the top lineman you would not want to lose on the on the offensive line, not the offense. I think you the way you rated him, I think you had mm-hmm. uh, Derek Carr number one. You wouldn't want to lose, and you wouldn't want to lose Alvin Kamara, but. But uh, but McCoy was in your at the top of your list, wasn't he? Yeah, he and Fuaga. It was it was a coin toss between those two. I mean, I think Fuaga being a left tackle uh, because because they really have nobody behind Fuaga of his ability, uh, he would probably be number two on my list. But McCoy's right there. I mean, we're we're nick picking nits here, but it's just a guy you don't want to miss because of the things he does at the center position and because of his really elite level play. I mean, he's a pro bowl player. So that's a significant loss. And, uh, you know, I think it, it definitely impacted the saints in their loss to the Eagles, but I think it's being a little overplayed, frankly. Uh, you know, if you go back and watch that game, the Eagles just whipped the saints up front. A lot's been made of this five, two, six, one scheme. Uh, you know, I was talking to some saints players this week about it and, They said it wasn't a scheme. It was we just got beat. You know, we got beat at the point of attack, and that's exactly how I saw it. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, not very many teams are going to be able to play that scheme or that alignment. They're not going to break their defensive tradition to play that way, and they're not going to have the talent that Philadelphia has. Philadelphia has a lot of first-round draft picks in that defensive front. So I don't think it's going to be something the Saints have to worry about going forward, but it's something they definitely have to be prepared for. Well, you said going into the season that this first few games was going to be tough. <laughs> I mean, it's just 
And Philadelphia was one of those games you said was going to be tough. And we still almost won it in spite of all these challenges. You know, as you yeah. pointed out before the show started, the will to win coupled with one or two big plays may be the difference in a ball game like this. Well, I mean, look, if the Saints have a little better alignment on the on the short, shallow cross to Dallas Goddard, they probably win the game. I mean, the Eagles had to go the length of the field for a touchdown, and they got a 61-yard pass because of, you know, just just some unfortunate luck, really, more than anything else. Uh, you know, credit Philadelphia for making it happen, but uh, that was a fluky play. They ran that again 10 times. I don't think it would happen again that way. So uh, I thought I, they showed a remarkable grit to come back. They put together a touchdown drive when they had to have it. I think that drive also included, if I remember correctly, you know, a big penalty against the Saints that they overcame. And then the touchdown pass to Olave was just perfectly placed, perfect catch. Uh, so they executed when they had to. And I think that's very that's a good sign of a team that had struggled all game offensively. And then when their backs were against the wall, they they came up big. So Jeff, when you factor in Taysom Hill not being in that game, do you see it as being relatively dramatic in terms of how how it changes the play calling uh, for that game? Well, it definitely factored in. Uh, you know, what they do with Taysom Hill is they use him as almost a chess piece because he's such a unique player. Defenses have to determine how they're going to defend him. And where he's at oftentimes determines how they're going to defend him. So he's got two two variables. One, where he's at aligned, and then two, how you identify him as either a tight end or a running back. So he creates a lot of problems pre-snap for defenses, and Clint Kubiak utilizes that in, in how they dictate to the defense their personnel matchups. Uh, I don't know if it had made a difference in winning and losing the game. Sometimes I think we overstate that. I mean, Philadelphia just came to play. You got their A game. They were shutting down the run. And, uh, you know, whether Taysom was there or not, I think they were still had trouble mustering. I mean, if you can't block people, Taysom can't run over three guys, you know. So I, I just – it definitely was a factor. Uh, but the way the Philadelphia plays defense, the Saints were still running the same offensive sets without Taysom Hill. Two tight ends, two backs. They weren't in a lot of three receiver sets. And that's actually been the kryptonite against Philadelphia – has been what, what what Atlanta did. They ran a lot of three receiver sets and got them in lighter personnel and ran on them. The Saints didn't do that. Clint Kubiak identified that later. He was a little slow to adjust, to be honest with you. I thought he should have gone to that earlier because they were running against a brick wall with their two tight end, two back sets. Well, again, um, you said it was going to be a tough run of games. We're two and one. That's not a bad start for the season. And uh, I saw where Saunders is back. Yes, Colin Saunders will be back. So that'll provide some interior depth. It'll be interesting to see, I, I mean, where they rotate him in because I thought the, the defensive tackle they brought in from the commanders, John Ridgway, actually played pretty well in, in relief. I mean, the big story that came out from the game uh, on the, along the line was Cam Jordan's usage. I mean, I think he had 20 snaps, it's the lowest of his career, and Dennis Allen did not pull punches when we asked him about him on Monday. He basically said, you're going to see more Chase Young uh, going forward. And, uh, you know, th that means basically a de-emphasis of Cam Jordan in the, in the defensive rotation. And I think that's pretty significant given, you know, the accomplishments of his career. Yeah, you, you here's a player that in Cam Jordan that rarely even sat out of play. And uh, I think the coach is essentially um, admitting to the world that Cam has either lost a step or some other players are playing better than him. That's, that's just kind of where we are. Yeah, father time catches up to everyone. I mean, he was drafted in 2011, Ricky. I think last time I looked, there was like five players left in the league from that draft. Uh, the one that's still playing at high level is Calais Campbell, amazingly. But Cam, Cam's dropped off the last few years, and I thought he would still be a productive rotational player, but uh, he's, even, he's even dropped off more than that. And I, it'll be interesting to see what happens to him after this season if, if he does elect to keep playing or chooses to retire. I mean, he's done a lot of media work. He's doing a lot of media work. I think he's prepared for life after football, and he may be facing that reality soon. Well, you said you you said it more than once going into this season. You said it last year 
that Father Time will catch up. You know, this could this could be the year. And when you question having older players and whether they could they could be, you know, reliable for an entire season. I mean, this was a big concern for you. Yeah, and we're seeing it right now with Mario Davis having injuries, right? I mean, that, that's what happens when you start reaching your mid thirties in the NFL. It's just it's a difficult sport to play. Your body just eventually it takes a toll. You know, it's interesting, like Tyron Matthews is a good example. Talked to him earlier this year, and he said he's – I think I, we talked about this on the podcast. He, he's down to 185, and he dropped that weight because he wants to be quicker as he's gotten older. And you can see it on the field. He actually is much quicker. He's making plays everywhere. But you also see offenses countering that, and that's attacking him. And they're going after him because he only weighs 185. And the, and the Eagles did a good job of that with their tight end. So there's a give and take to that. When we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation about this upcoming game with the Atlanta Falcons with Jeff Duncan. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I've got Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. He's a, an award-winning columnist and um, on the NFL Hall of Fame Selection Committee and He's pretty renowned, and we're lucky to have him every Friday to talk about the Saints. Hey, real quick before we get back to the Saints, <clears throat> what I remember well about about NOLA.com's numbers was that, um, the, I mean, the, the, the amount of traffic at NOLA.com around Saints coverage was enormous. I, I would say probably take all the other coverage in the entire city and add it all up, and it probably still didn't stack up to the amount of traffic at NOLA.com when it comes to Saints coverage. You know, when the, t- the, the, the team, you know, starts off the year with two great wins and still still on a per game, on, on a per game basis, when you look at the stats, they're still performing pretty well. Um, how much does that traffic drop off when they lose a game? I'm just curious, you know, what you know about. Oh, yeah, it's still reflecting that way. I mean, the first two weeks, traffic was off the charts. It was actually still pretty high for this Eagles game. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it's amazing how it it ebbs and flows with, you know, the production on the field or the success on the field. Uh, but people are always interested in, in the Saints and the NFL in general. I mean, we we have huge traffic numbers on other NFL teams when we post things. So it's I've never seen anything quite like the popularity of the NFL, Ricky. I mean, it's just such a enormously popular product. Uh, you know, we see ratings going off the charts right now, television ratings. Uh, I think they're going to start playing games more often on Friday nights just to get that that, that sole audience there. Uh, I just eventually I think it's going to take over the world. They're going to start playing games in South America. We see uh, I think they're eventually going to go to Africa. It's just an amazing sport. And I think the product is so good on the yeah. field. You just you can watch any any of the two teams play and it's a fun game. No, I agree. I totally agree. My son, Jordan, was at the game, and uh, he has bad luck uh, when he goes to games. <laughs> he just <laughs> – he's and he says – he calls me on the way home, I'm never going to a game again. <laughs> and then, of course, he gets home, and he says, God, man, that just kind of messed up my – what I'm going to do for the next several days in terms of how I interact with Saints content. And it usually, yeah. usually takes me a day or two. And then finally, I'm, I'm coming back to it quickly because I really want to know what happened. I'm a little depressed right after, but then I kind of want to know what happened. And and when I watch a wide range of folks, especially NOLA.com, I come back from looking at it saying – you know what? It was just a hard-fought game that we could have won, but we played a good team, didn't we? Well, here's the other thing. I wrote this a little bit in my follow-up column. I mean, the Dome was rocking, man. It was electric atmosphere. Pre-game when Drew, Drew Brees did the, the Who Dat chant, I mean, it was as loud as I've heard it in maybe half a decade. So if they have that home field advantage, they're not going to lose many games there. It was a factor. Even the Eagles players and coaches were talking about it. I mean, it was chaos. That was what was amazing on that last drive. The Eagles took over needing a touchdown, and they were down. Their two best wide receivers weren't in the game. Their two starting right side offensive linemen weren't in the game. They were missing four starters in that environment and, and managed to go down and get a touchdown. It was pretty remarkable. It, it really is. And I, I give Kyle a lot of credit for, <clears throat> for creating, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for creating that situation. 
I, I always said that when the music's great, the Saints win, and when when the uh, Saints lose, it's a it's a bad game plan. <laughs> you know, I don't of course. I don't ever blame him, but you know, the, I think they do a great job with the music, and it gets people riled up. And I notice oh, yeah. the players get interacting with it, so it's pretty cool, isn't it? And I think also the the new renovations in the dome. I mean, Kyle can attest. I mean, it's it's a little brighter in there. It, it's just a really cool atmosphere in there now. The lighting, our photographers have talked about it. It's much better. You can see. It's, it, there was always a time where it was a little dingy in there. No more. I mean, they've got brand new lighting. These new ribbon boards brighten things up, and they're they're synchronized with the music. So it's almost like going to a rock concert, and, and it feels that way uh, when you come out of there. It's it's definitely uh, it's definitely back to its old standard. Put it that way. Hey, Cal. Cal, they need to put a camera on you, and every now and then, show everybody who you are. No, we, we need to make you famous. <laughs> so, no, I'm good. <laughs> so, Jeff, as we uh, as we move forward on the uh, on the Atlanta Falcons, that is going to be one hell of a, a game. Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. You know, the way that game ended last year in the Dome. I think it's going to be talked about in Atlanta. I mean, that's the downside with doing that is it's going to come back to you. And uh, there's a lot of players who are still on that team. They're going to remember that. So it's going to be fun. I mean, the team that executes best is going to win this game. I think this is a game the Saints have to be very clean. They they do not need to have any pre-snap penalties. That's something I'm a little worried about, playing in that environment with a bunch of new offensive linemen, a new center. I mean, I think you're going to see uh, Shane Lemieux at center in this game. Uh, this is a guy who wasn't even on the active roster for the first three weeks, and he's being out elevated up from the practice squad. Uh, he started in the league, uh, you know, a few games over the years, but he's going to get tested in there against David Onyemata and Grady Jarrett. And I really believe if the Saints can hit some big plays down the field to Shahid and Olave, they could win this game, but they're going to have to connect on those when they get the opportunities. Yeah, you, you liked Shane Lem- Lemieux during training camp, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, he's a fine player. I mean, he's, you know, he's not Eric McCoy, but I think what the Saints are doing is they're saying, look, we have three, uh, two injuries up front. We have three spots. We want to keep everybody in the same spot instead of moving Lucas Patrick around. They had to do that last week in the middle of the game, but it makes sense to me to to not move as many, is to move as few of people as possible. Put it that way. Well, we know what Atlanta's going to try to do. They're going to try to run that ball. Yeah, B. John Robinson is – they're going to have to tackle better. That was a big problem last week too. I mean, the Saints had a couple opportunities in open field to make tackles and, and miss tackles, and they cannot afford that with this guy because he will go the, he'll go the distance. And you go back to the first two games, Jeff, and if they, their tackling in open space was beautiful. That's where I get back to what I'm talking about, the intangibles of are you dialed in, are you focused – you know, that, that, that stuff matters. That's where you see it in, in little sloppiness like that. Uh, you know, coming off the ball quickly, Atlanta was, I mean, Philadelphia, there were a few times where Trevor Penning was getting driven into the backfield, blowing up plays because he wasn't coming off the ball as, with the urgency he needed to, and Philly was. Those little things are what show up on tape. And then he gets frustrated and drives a guy 10 yards out of bound and gets that 15-yard penalty. Yep. Didn't um, hurt. It ended up not hurting him. But it could have. Oh man, you just can't. You can't do that. I wish he would do that on the field at the snap, and we'd be in good shape, wouldn't we? Well, he does. <laughs> he's their enforcer. That's that's his role, and he's he's uh, I think embracing it. Yeah, I th- I, well, that part I think is really cool. You you said this, in, and I think it's true that Shahid and <clears throat> Alave, we need a big play. A big play to either one of those guys against Philadelphia would have been the difference in the ball game. We just couldn't. Yeah, we got one obviously with Olave on that touchdown, but Shahid super close with Shahid. I mean, it's a game of micro, you know, micro inches. But that's what that's what you got. You got to convert those, don't you? Yeah, he's got to learn some a uh, little bit of going up and getting the ball. He tends to wait on it to come down, and by that time it's too late. It gets broken up. He's not strong enough to win that contested catch battle. So he's got to learn to jump up and get it before it gets down into the traffic. It's something that's you know part of his development as a as a receiver. Do you think we're going to see more play from the tight ends in terms of uh, receptions? Yes, it needs to be a part of the offense. I don't know what's going on. Why they haven't gotten the ball, Juwan Johnson? Something we asked Dennis Allen about. He said that they've had plays called 
and coverage is dictated, you know, the ball goes elsewhere, which I understand. But at some point, they've got to get him involved. He's a good player, and he can stretch the defense and create mismatches, and he's just been non-existent so far in the way the Saints are running things. And I think they, they obviously have to find someone else other than Alvin Kamara uh, to carry the ball. That's gonna, You know, when Kendra Miller comes back, hopefully he can help in that regard. But Alvin Kamara got beat up in this game, and Taysom Hill is going to get beat up. He already has. So they're going to have to find a third back, and it, I think it's going to have to come from Kendra Miller. Well, you took you took the thought right out of my mind. There's there's two points I was going to make. One is that with Jawan Johnson, he is going to win the contested catches. <clears throat> he's such a big physical guy. And secondly, when you when he's getting the ball, that means that Alvin Kamara is not getting the ball. And you know, at his age and his injuries now, you can't ride him like that. I mean, that was just hard to watch last week. Yeah, there was one point where I think the first 19 passes and runs, 14 of them were Kamara. Uh, that's just too much for anybody. I mean, Derrick Henry can't handle that. So, yeah, they got to spread the wealth around, and they know that, and I think they will this week. And like I said, I, I think I think it's, the Saints can get after Atlanta up front in the passing game. The key is going to be first down, second down, for Atlanta. I mean, can can the Saints hold them and get them into third and long? They've been awful in third third down this year, one of the worst in the league. Uh, if they're successful on first down, that's going to make those third downs easier for them. So to me, that's the whole key to the game. Can the Saints win first and second down? And I think they certainly can. They've, they're healthy, pretty much healthy on defense. Obviously, the loss of DeMario would be big. And Alante Taylor, who we didn't mention, also missed practice Wednesday. That's a little bit concerning, too, because of the way he started the season. It's going to be an interesting game, man. New quarterback for, for Atlanta, uh, who has shown he can be really good at times. And uh, so it's going to be – Derek Carr is going to have to bring his A game, isn't he? Yeah, and he's going to have to avoid the back-breaking turnovers like he had last year in Atlanta if he threw that pick six to Jesse Bates that flipped that game over. The Saints looked like they were in control. And again, they've got to tackle well against this, this two, two-headed combination at running back. And they can move. The game plan has to be very similar to what they use with Matt Ryan. That's keep him in the pocket, move him off his spot, keep, keep him moving around. Uh, and I think they'll be very successful defensively. Hey, Kyle, that's it, huh? But give me a nod. Okay, very good. Jeff, it's been a pleasure, my friend. All right, anytime. Talk to you next week, Ricky. You bet, you bet. Hey, when we come back, we're going to be visited with Caleb from Super Talk Mississippi News. We'll see you after this. 